Hello everyone, Dr. David Perlmutter here. We're gonna talk about mitochondria today. Mitochondria, you know, the energy producers, the powerhouses within every cell. Brain cells may have as many as a thousand mitochondria in each neuron. Uh, mitochondria are seen diffusely throughout the body in virtually all of our cells, interestingly not in our red blood cells, but certainly in our white blood cells and having good mitochondrial function and numbers within our white blood cells uh, is an important player as it relates to a proper, effective immune function and keeping uh, inflammation in balance. We know that mitochondrial dysfunction or problems with the mitochondria uh, is uh, something that's at the, the core of some of our most pervasive issues like cancer and coronary artery disease, cardiovascular disease in general, and certainly as it relates to the brain and things like dementia. Uh, the brain is a very energy-hungry organ. The brain weighs, what, 3 to 5% of the total body weight, and yet at rest may be consuming as much as 25% of the caloric expenditure of the entire body. So the brain does uh, use a lot of energy and as such it is highly dependent upon functionality of the mitochondria. So the question that becomes how can we enhance mitochondrial biogenesis? What a great term that is. It simply means what can we do to increase the number of mitochondria that are available for energy production. And one of the simplest measurements that can uh, be done to look at mitochondria involves looking at the levels of mitochondria within the red blood cells. It's a simple blood draw, and then you uh, evaluate actually the DNA, mitochondrial DNA, which is different from the normal cellular DNA, that lives in the white blood cells. That gives you an indication as to how many mitochondria are present within our white blood cells. And it does serve as a surrogate marker for us to make assessments in terms of what mitochondria are doing throughout the rest of the body. So as it turns out, there is research that demonstrates uh, that we can, in fact, increase our mitochondrial density, in this case, measured in the white blood cells. And this was an interesting study that looked at the effect of a low fructose and low sodium diet uh, on the DNA that was measured uh, of mitochondria in white blood cells in human subjects. And again, it's really very important, uh, at least in this study, they recognize the importance of dysfunction or problems with the mitochondria uh, as being a major risk factor in things like obesity, diabetes, and hypertension. And because it is uh, related to obesity, diabetes, and hypertension, we then know uh, that it is related to the downstream issues uh, that are consequences of obesity and diabetes and hypertension, things like uh, coronary artery disease, uh, Alzheimer's disease, and even cancer are the downstream manifestations or brought about when these mechanisms are activated. So we've connected some dots then between mitochondrial dysfunction and some of the most important degenerative conditions on the planet, things like heart disease and cancer and stroke, for example, and certainly Alzheimer's disease. So I'd like to consider the statement, however, from a different perspective from the perspective of down-regulating mitochondria, making mitochondria less functional, and how that may have acted as what we call a survival mechanism. So when we have high levels of fructose and or high levels of sodium in the diet, it really primes the body, or at least the bodies of our ancestors, for survival by down-regulating or making less functional the mitochondria. Why? Because when mitochondria are less functional, we have less energy utilization, and that can be a really powerful advantage when there's not a lot of food around. So if the mitochondria are not burning as much energy, it might allow survival when the very energy that it would burn uh, is less abundant. And in addition, we know that when mitochondrial function is compromised, it leads to the generation of fat. And that, of course, can be a survival mechanism. Now, let's look at the nuts and bolts uh, of the study. It looked at 36 uh, overweight, prehypertensive adults. 
and put them on either a low sodium defined as less than or equal to six grams a day or an isocaloric, meaning the same number of calories, low sodium and low fructose, meaning less than 20 grams a day of the fructose diet and followed these individuals for eight weeks and compared them to controls. Uh, and it looked at the measurement of how much DNA related to mitochondria was seen in the blood test, which looked at the white blood cells in a normal blood test. Uh, and the study went on uh, for an eight-week period of time, again, comparing a low-sodium diet to a low-sodium and low-fructose diet. And what did they find? They found that uh, with time, just putting them on a low-sodium diet led to a, at week eight, you see in the amber color, already the mitochondrial DNA is starting to tick up. Uh, and when you compare that on when week eight to being on low sodium and uh, cutting down the fructose to 20 grams a day, a dramatic increase, a 70-fold increase in the mitochondrial DNA, basically the number of mitochondria in the white blood cells that are present now because we're sending less alarm signals to our bodies to make fat, store fat, and to ratchet down mitochondrial function. Now, the authors of the study proposed a mechanism, uh, and that is that the mechanism for protection could relate, uh, in other words, how did it protect against damaging uh, the mitochondria to decreasing oxidative stress as changes in oxidants parallel the changes in mitochondrial density. What does that mean? Higher levels of oxidative stress threaten the viability, the life, the number of mitochondria. When you put people on a low-sodium, low-fructose diet, you're putting them on a lower threat, a lower oxidative stress level as it relates to their mitochondria. So more mitochondria are created, and these mitochondria survive. That's what we want. What they noted in the low-sodium, low-fructose group, this gets a little technical, but they, loaded that, they noted that the level of something called DNPH, dinitrophenylhydrazine, was decreased by 52%. Now, that sounds pretty scientific. Let me tell you what that means. That's a marker of oxidative stress. That's a marker of the damaging action of chemicals called free radicals. It's the reason we take antioxidants. In addition, and that number went down quite dramatically, the uric acid level went down by 22% in people who are on a low-sodium, low-fructose diet. Why might that be? Well, fructose directly raises uric acid, and sodium raises uric acid a little bit indirectly because it increases the conversion of glucose into fructose, which then raises uric acid. That's called the polyol pathway. So this is really quite a fascinating study that demonstrates by lowering sodium and reducing fructose consumption, there is a dramatic effect upon the number of mitochondria and therefore mitochondrial function as we see with less oxidative stress demonstrated by the reduction in the DNPH. Well, that was an interesting study, wasn't it? It showed that low sodium and a low fructose diet combined uh, after the eight weeks was associated with a dramatic increase in mitochondrial density as measured again by the amount of mitochondrial DNA that was found in the white blood cells. Again, a surrogate marker basically for DNA of the mitochondria throughout the body and therefore mitochondria throughout the body. We want to do what we can to uh, help our mitochondria work, uh, help them uh, repopulate, help them regrow, enhance what I mentioned earlier called mitochondrial biogenesis, meaning the growth of new mitochondria, and at the same time, rid our bodies of defective mitochondria, which is something called mito mitophagy, part of the broader term autophagy. And here we've learned that a low sodium slash low fructose diet uh, is really effective in doing that. And I think, you know, the area that is united by low fructose and low sodium, the mechanism that they share is, of course, this downstream production of uric acid. 
So we are upstream of uric acid. We know that uric acid is a, an instigator of oxidative stress, can damage mitochondria, can compromise uh, cellular function, can increase inflammation, can compromise uh, nitric oxide, therefore lead to poor blood supply, and at the same time uh, compromises insulin sensitivity. So the downstream effects of higher levels of sodium in the diet and higher levels of fructose in the diet is an elevation of the uric acid. And this was a, a very dramatic demonstration, a 70-fold increase in, uh, after eight weeks of the mitochondrial DNA in the white blood cells. Very interesting information, and I think uh, for many of you this will be quite thought-provoking. Hope you enjoyed our time together today. I did. Thanks for joining me. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter. Bye for now.